Having promised us a technological utopia, our ubiquitous and intrusive cyber culture has instead precipitated a spiritual crisis in which human experience has been systematically fragmented and the coherence of the self increasingly threatened. Living in a culture of organized distractions, our thoughts are isolated and disconnected, preventing us from seeing and experiencing the wholeness of life. Distraction and fragmentation have negative consequences for the organization of knowledge. They prevent us from engaging our spiritual depth and render us incapable of engaging the spiritual depth of others. For having lost touch with our own personhood, we can receive neither the personhood of our neighbor nor of God. <clears throat> Beginning in 2009, the New York Times ran a series of articles called Driven to Distraction, focusing on accidents and fatalities involving distracted drivers. As per the most recent statistics, we have about 4,000 fatalities a year in the United States due to distracted uh, drivers. The series expanded to include distracted doctoring, reporting on the large number of surgeons who are placing personal calls during surgery, on medical technicians who are texting while running bypass machines, and anesthesiologists who are shopping online for airline tickets. <clears throat> Distractions created by social media in the workplace cost the American economy $650 billion per year, with social media interruptions occurring approximately every 10 minutes, and with workers spending 41% of their time on Facebook. In the U.S. alone, uh, over 12 billion collective hours are spent browsing on social networks every day, while the average college student spends at least three hours a day checking social sites and less than two hours a day uh, studying. In addition to the financial costs and loss of human life, uh, there, is, there are spiritual costs as well, including the loss of human agency, the fragmentation of human subjectivity, and the growing incoherence of the self. Okay. In his recent book, The World Beyond Your Head, Matthew Crawford has referred to the situation as a, quote, crisis of self-ownership, arguing that we are now living in an attentional economy in which our attention, he says, is not simply ours any longer to direct where we will, making the effort to be fully present an intractable struggle. Crawford claims that our need for endless distractions means that the content of our distractions has become largely irrelevant, revealing a deeper crisis of values. According to Crawford, we have become, quote, agnostic on the question of what to pay attention to, which means we no longer know what to value. As a result, our inner lives become shapeless and we become susceptible to what is presented to us by powerful commercial forces that have taken the place of traditional cultural authorities. To be attentive, on the other hand, is the first step in reclaiming our humanity, our agency, and self-determination as human beings. We choose what to pay attention to, and in a very real sense, this determines what is real for us, what is actually present to our consciousness. By contrast, distraction and fragmentation reveal an ethical void at the center of our existence, prompting Crawford to call for what he calls an ethics and an ascetics of attention uh, for our time and grounded in a realistic account of the human mind. To be sure, the ethics and, and ascetics of attention that Crawford is seeking are central to orthodox anthropology and moral psychology, namely the practice of attentiveness, prosochi, or attending to oneself, prosechin seafto. Uh, the phrase itself is derived from Deuteronomy 4.9, 4, uh, attend to thyself and keep thy heart diligently, or alternately from Deuteronomy 15.9, uh, attend to thyself that there be no hidden iniquitous word in your heart. The phrase, which is an ethical imperative, has a long and rich history from which only a few examples can be cited here. In the fourth century life of Antony, we are told that Antony's very first ascetic practice which he undertook before entering the desert was to, quote, attend to himself. Antony's younger contemporary, Basil of Caesarea, uh, wrote what is likely the first homily devoted exclusively to Deuteronomy 15.9 on the words, give heed to thyself. Though the life of Antony does not describe the practice of attentiveness in any detail, Basil describes it at length. 
far from mere external self-observation and having nothing to do with any kind of solipsistic self-absorption, attentiveness is comprehensive in scope, being at once the awakening of the rational principles that God has placed in the soul, vigilant stewardship over the movements of the mind which govern the movements of the body and thus society as a whole, the awareness of the mind's priority over the body and of the beauty of God over sensory pleasure, an engagement with reality and a rejection of mental fantasies, self-examination and the refusal to meddle in the affairs of others, and finally and not least, the very knowledge of God himself insofar as the self is the image of God, a connection which Basil concludes the entire sermon, quote, give heed therefore to thyself that you may give heed to God. Prosehe un se auto ina prosechis theo. The practice of attending to the self was firmly established by the fourth century and remained central to Christian anthropology. Subsequent generations of writers and practitioners developed the concept, generally aligning attentiveness with cognate practices such as stillness, isichia, and vigilance, or nipsis, as you can see in the quotation by St. Nikiforos here on the screen. Now, in this more comprehensive form, it was given a foundational role in Christian life and was ultimately considered a necessary presupposition or precondition for salvation, as you can see here in the passage from Peter of Damascus. The extraordinary emphasis given to attentiveness is explained not simply because the human mind is prone to distraction, but because the disintegration of our inner life began precisely with the fall, when humanity separated itself from God. Distraction, from this point of view, has been rightly called the original sin of the mind. The notion of the primal transgression as a fall from attentiveness into distractions is a central element in the theology of the fifth century writer Saint Diavokos of Fotiki. And I quote, divine knowledge teaches us that our natural perceptive faculty is, is single, but that it's split into two different modes of operation as a result of Adam's disobedience. Created with a single, simple, and undivided consciousness, the fall shattered the integrity of the self into two conflicting activities, one drawn to divine realities and the other dragged outward into the surface appearances of the visible world and subsequently subject to a process of ongoing fragmentation. We find similar views in the writings of St. Gregory of Sinai who argues that the human mind created in a state of rest became agitated and distracted when it fell from grace by choosing corporeal sensation over God and subsequently found itself lost and wandering among the things of the world. Forgetting God and grasping at the world, we become subject to unhealthy desires and addictive behaviors driven by a continuous preoccupation with and pursuit of nothing. Being fixated on the superficial appearances of things, we have no awareness of their deeper meanings or mutual relatedness but seek only that part of an object or person that can temporarily satisfy our desire for pleasure. Habitually surrendering, surrendering to our irrational drives and impulses, the mind becomes enslaved to sensations, whether they, whether they be bodily or psychological. We splinter into isolated fragments, leading double and triple lives, being self-divided into numberless unrelated acts, so that our pursuit of pleasure contributes not to the unity of the self and, and the world, but rather to the disintegration and disorganization of both. Divided into unrelated acts of irrational sensation, the mind receives only the fleeting impression of something finite and isolated from everything else. This condition has been diagnosed and described by orthodox spiritual and ascetic writers who call it the scattering or the dispersal of the mind. For example, Nikitas Tithatos contends that, quote, to the extent that our inner life is in a state of discord and dispersed among many contrary things, we are unable to participate in the life of God. We desire opposing and contrary things, and we are torn apart by the relentless, relentless warfare between them. And this is called the discord of the mind, a condition that divides and destroys the soul. As long as we are afflicted by the turmoil of our thoughts, and as long as we are ruled and constrained by our passions, we are self-fragmented and cut off from the divine unity. Yet, if attentiveness is the answer to the dilemma of human fragmentation and disintegration, the aim is not a return to a presumed Edenic form of consciousness, but rather to the grace of the Holy Spirit placed in our hearts at the time of our baptism. 
This sacramental focus on baptism is central to the theology of the Avachos, uh, for whom healing begins with the gift of the Holy Spirit, while the fragmentation of the fallen self is unified through the invocation of the Jesus prayer. It follows then that the primary motivation for the practice of inner attention, the purpose of turning inward and entering the heart, is to encounter the indwelling grace of the Holy Spirit, a principle that was consistently and indeed systematically reaffirmed by the later Byzantine hesychasts. We find essentially the same teaching in scripture. The prodigal son left his home and went into a faraway place where, the gospel says, he dispersed or scattered his substance, the escorpisen dinusia naftu. On one level, this means that he squandered all his money, but the deeper meaning is the wealth of the soul, our spiritual inheritance, since our substance is the spirit that God has placed within us and in which, through holy baptism, God has planted his own grace, clothing us in, in the protistoli, our original garment of glory, and sending forth his own, his own spirit into our hearts. But when we separate ourselves from, from this grace, we lose our spiritual unity and become fragmented. Conclusion. The fallen human mind is fragmented, uh, prone to distractions and scattered across an infinity of disconnected thoughts and sensations. Our minds are always elsewhere than our bodies. Rather than working to alleviate this weakness, we have instead built a culture of organized distractions, aiding and abetting the mind in its fallen condition. It can be argued that the computer itself is a fallen mind, a powerful extension of our own dubious desires created after our own image. Lingering unregenerately in a realm of illusions, mesmerized by the images flitting about on our computer screens, we become dull predatory flies buzzing at the window screen of our computers, desperate to consume all the futility of the world. Yet, we are not the predators, but the prey. We are not the users of information technologies and social media, but rather we are being used, manipulated, and exploited by them. In our culture of distractions, public and private spaces are increasingly saturated with technologies designed to arrest and appropriate our attention. Our interior mental lives, like our bodies, are merely resources to be harvested by powerful economic interests so that, in the words of one thinker, distractibility is to the mind what obesity is to the body. Our focus then should not be simply on technology and digital culture alone, but on the interests and motivations that guide their design and promote their dissemination into every aspect of our life. Throughout its long history, Christi Christianity has often been some subservient to the prevailing political and economic structures, forgetting that the gospel is not derivative of human culture, but generative of a new way of life. We need to recover the power of the gospel as a counter-cultural force, not with the aim of destabilizing society, but in order to create life-affirming communities. We need to rediscover not simply that our faith and vocation to holiness set us apart from the world, but that they also engender a new alternative world, not a virtual reality, but the reality of virtue. In order to realize our calling, attentiveness must be our fundamental attitude and ethos. Without attentiveness, there is no prayer, and without prayer, there is no communion with God, no participation in divine life. The practice of inner attention, of descending with the mind into the heart, is both an activity and a way of life that locates us in authentic existence, that is, in our relationship with God. This is why attentiveness is so often said to be equivalent to the recollection of God, to the conscious awareness of the grace of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Taking heed of and attending to ourselves is the most effective method for reclaiming ownership of our self-determination from those who wish to take it from us. Transfigured by grace, attention will discover new objects of attention because it will have as its source a new subject, no longer conformed to the form of the world, but transformed in the renewal of its mind, possessing and possessed by the mind of Christ. Thank you. <laughs>